Good morning and welcome to Faith Reformed Church. If you have any announcements, please make your way forward at this time. It is the first week of Sunday School, and we'll have a lot more to say about that later on in the service, so I'll save those announcements for then. And then tonight, we also have the first week of our core small group Bible studies. That's for grades 6 through 12. It's at 6 o'clock until 7 o'clock right here at Faith Reform, so we'd like to invite all 6th through 12th graders to come and join a group. And then our Wednesday night ministries are back to normal. Uh, for Adventure Island, we have that here for grades K through 5 at 6.30, and for Connect, grades 6 through 12, that is at 1st EPC at 6 o'clock. And one more note on Adventure Island, this is good news that there were a whole lot of kindergartners and first graders there. Uh, the additional news is that that means we need more teachers. So if anyone is willing to help teach every other month for kindergarten, first grade, at Adventure Island on Wednesday nights, that would be great. Please contact Wendy Wanzer if you are willing and able to do that. Good morning. I'm Colette, and I just want to share an opportunity with some of you moms that will be starting next week, Sunday. During Sunday school, we do not provide nursery for moms with young children, so we thought we would maybe meet with moms in the nursery during Sunday school time to discuss motherhood and all that entails. Um, this isn't just for moms with young children. This would be for any moms, whether your kids are in diapers or driving or engaged or whatever it might be. Um, we just thought it would be a good time to meet and connect together during Sunday school um, in the nursery amongst goldfish and all the other stuff that happens with young children um, next week, Sunday. And with that, we just want to really encourage moms to, to prioritize this time. Sometimes it can be thought of for Sunday school hour that you have 30, 40 minutes of kind of free time while your kids are in Sunday school or whatever else. But we really want to encourage you to prioritize this because it sets a really good example for your kids as well as they're going to Sunday school that you also are. Um, but it also, we're hoping it can be a good opportunity to connect and, and grow and that that time wouldn't return void in your own lives and that we can connect with each other and moms in all different um, parts of life. So that's next week, Sunday, starting and in the nursery. We'll hope to see you there. I'd like to call your attention to new two announcements in the bulletin. The first one is uh, volunteering at Pine Haven. They are in desperate need of people to volunteer there to transport residents uh, within the facility to wherever they need to go. Uh, right now, if the volunteers aren't there, the staff has to do it, and it takes time for them to do it, and it's, it's, we're already short-staffed in that uh, area. So if you would have time, the dates are in there on, in the bulletin as far as you could volunteer for uh, once a week or once a month, it certainly would help. Also, the annual meeting will be coming up a week from tomorrow night, <clears throat> and uh, we are short on people at the meeting. Uh, there's a lot of uh, churches that do not have a, a member on the board, so we don't have a quorum with the board members, and uh, we're looking for, I'm looking for at least one person if they could join me at the meeting a week from Monday night. So if you could do that, I would appreciate it if you would let me know. Thank you. The other important things as well, um, because this is Promotion Sunday, we actually don't have communion today. Normally we do have it the second Sunday of the month, but we're going to do it next Sunday instead. So do prepare your hearts as we partake of the elements together next week. Uh, also, please do see your box in the narthex. There's a lot going on today, so I don't want this to get lost, but please do see your box in the narthex with an envelope that has information for nominating officers over the next month. You'll find in that a letter from the session, along with information on the office of elder and deacon, and a list of men open to nomination. Uh, in addition, there's also going to be ballots for each member in your family in the envelope. And so do keep that in mind. Read over that. Pray over that. Be thinking about the biblical qualifications for the elder and deacon. We'll be talking more about that in future weeks as well. Nominations should be submitted in the box that's in the narthex uh, between mine and John's office by October 9th. Uh, in addition, three 
other items uh, to draw your attention to um, now that we're getting so many ministries started this fall. I just want to point out a few things that we've done over the past few weeks and one new one today. And one is, don't forget uh, about the small group booklet. Um, we put some of these out by the boxes as well. If you're not in a small group, I know people have been gone and traveling and so forth throughout the summer and August, but we do have this booklet which has an opportunity for different people to plug into small groups. It tells you about when the small groups meet, who the contact person or leader is, what they're going through, and do take advantage of that this fall. It's never too late to jump into one, and the leaders would love to hear from you. In addition, we also did have this printed uh, out last week, which is the Adult Sunday School plan for this year through next spring. Uh, and so this is also out in the narthex and in different spots where the bulletins are. Do look at this. It talks about what we're going to be doing in Adult Sunday School, and it's going to start today uh, as BJ is going to be teaching uh, on knowing God, along with a few other teachers. There's going to be a rotation of teachers that are essentially going through the material in J.I. Packer's book. And as mentioned, there's a sign-up if you want the book out in the narthex. Um, if you just give a $15 donation to the church, there's books out there that you can take. Uh, in addition, you don't need to have the book to enjoy the Sunday school class. They're going to be using that as a guide to teach. And so you can use that if you would like, but please do come. And BJ is going to be setting a context for what to expect today. And then the last thing is, and we're going to be talking more about this over the next three weeks, we do have a pamphlet that is also out in the narthex and in different spots um, out there on our family and children's ministry. We've talked about this over the past few uh, weeks, the past month or so, that there's a new team that's really been a conglomeration of a previous team that existed uh, overseeing children's ministry, but also with an additional focus on coming alongside families in the church as well. And you'll see this in the pamphlet. We essentially put down what our goal is for our children and for families. And in short, this is it. This is our vision for children. We want to see children in our church become passionate followers of Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about that more today. Uh, we also, at the same time, for our families, want to see families raise their children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And these things come together in our ministry purpose, that we aim to intentionally disciple children in the church as we encourage and equip parents in the home in order to raise up passionate followers of Christ in the next generation. Uh, that's our goal ultimately, to have a partnership between both home and church and seeing children come to be passionate followers of Christ. That's why we do some of the things that we do on Promotion Sunday, and it's also why we're going to be focusing on how we can come alongside parents in the home over the next few weeks on our sermons um, and also what we do as a ministry team. And so I want to point that out to you. Grab one of these pamphlets. There's uh, several of them out there today, and we're going to be printing more if we need to. But go and read that. There's information about what we're trying to do and be praying for these ministries as we move forward. Uh, with that said, um, oh, I also tie to that as well, is out in the bulletin, or out in the narthex, we do have new children's bulletins. And there's ones for both younger and older. The youngers are called junior, the olders are called senior, and that has information from the sermon each week that will help your kids follow along and be intentional and engaged in the worship service. These are just some of the things that we're trying to do to help disciple our children. So be praying about that, think about that, grab a pamphlet. Uh, and with that said, we are here to worship our God in and through Jesus Christ. And so let us stand together and greet one another and remain standing for the call to worship. Good morning. And thank you to the fellowship team too. I meant to say that. Really noticed. No problem. Don't really want to stop all that nice talk. But anyway, good morning. Welcome to Faith Reform Church and to worshiping our Lord and God this morning. Call to worship comes from Psalm 68, and it says, Shout for the joy to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Come and see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds toward the children of men. Let us lift our voices and praise the Lord.
Almighty and infinite God, you are the God of the universe. You're the God who owns everything. The cattle on a thousand hills. You're the God who's created galaxies. The universe belongs to you and is upheld by the word of your power. And we don't dare come into your presence because of anything in us, but because you have determined in your grace that you are for us, that your love is a strong and mighty fortress. In your infinite power, you have shown grace to us by sending forth your Son, so that now we can come into your presence and know you as our God, knowing that nothing can separate us from your love. And so we can sing in joy. And so, Lord God, we ask that by your Spirit, you would strengthen us to sing with a joy that we ought to have as your people. May we give the praise to you that you deserve, and may we know your blessing by the Spirit. For it's in Christ we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We do know, as we just sang that last line, that our hearts are prone to wander. And we oftentimes do feel that. And this is one of the reasons why in our service we do take time to confess our sins before God. Uh, not because we need to somehow re-earn our salvation. We don't. But because that's part of maintaining a right relationship with our good and gracious God and Father. And we know that as we confess, He forgives us. But it's important for us to unburden ourselves and to let God know our sinfulness and to confess that to Him, even as we do so in prayer with one another. And so with that said, we're going to take a time of silent confession before going before God in a prayer of confession. Let's quiet ourselves now before the Lord. Gracious Father, we do recognize that you are our loving and kind King who has shown us your love in Christ. And yet even still, we recognize that we're so prone to wander. We feel it. We confess that we find nothing in ourselves but sin and weakness. We confess that you call us to live for you, to know you, to follow you, and even as we're going to see this morning, to make your name known to the next generation, in our church and in the home. 
And yet we recognize that we are so often slow to do this, slow to tell them about you. We can be so quick to tell them about a whole host of other things before we talk about you. And so, Father, we confess our sins. We confess, as Paul said, that nothing good dwells in us that is in our flesh. We humble ourselves before you, and we ask that you would root and tear out the poisonous weed of self-righteousness and pride, of selfishness. Forgive us of ways that we have not been faithful, and then fix our eyes upon the grace of your Son. For it's in him that we pray. Amen. And hear these words now of assurance from Romans 8. We just sang this in the first song. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, and more than that, was raised, who's at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And so let us now sing to our Lord in the assurance of salvation as being more than conquerors through Christ.
up for the children's message now. Good morning, everybody. It, it's great to see your faces up here. This morning, Pastor Zach is going to be preaching on the beginning of Psalm 78. And in that psalm, it tells about how important it is for parents and for all of us older people in the church to tell you guys about God. So this is a psalm that tells all about how important it is to teach you. So I decided this morning, I'm just going to recount some of the glorious deeds of the Lord, because that is what Psalm 78 says to do. So I think there's going to be some of these that you know, and there might be some that are not as familiar. Um, this one I think you probably know. Can you tell me who made everything? Just shout it out. God. God. That's right. God made everything, and he made everything perfectly. But then there was Adam and Eve. Who knows what they did? Josiah, what did they do? They sinned. They ate the fruit. They did the very thing that God told them not to do. But even though it would have been totally just for God to punish them right then and there and to kill them. He was gracious and he promised that he was going to make a way for them to come back to him, to come back to perfection. And then the whole rest of the Bible points towards that promise. And so there's um, Noah and the ark. Have you guys heard that story before where God saves Noah and his family it's okay, guys. God saves Noah and his family from destruction and death. And then there's Abraham, and God chose Abraham. There was nothing Abraham did in and of himself. He was not perfect. He did not always obey. He messed up all the time, but God chose him. And he told him that he was going to bless all the nations of the world through his family. And Abraham believed him. And then God said, I am granting, I'm counting righteousness to you. It wasn't, it wasn't righteousness that Abraham created. God gave it to him. And then he created a, a people for himself. All of Abraham's family would be God's. And from that moment on, he was going to take care of them. He was going to be their God. And they were going to be his people. And so all throughout the Old Testament, he saved them from famine. And he brought them out of slavery and parted the Red Sea. Do you remember hearing about that? About Moses? and the exodus and going through the Red Sea. He gave them food while they wandered in the desert. He made bread rain down from heaven and he made birds come to them so that they could kill them and eat them because God is in charge of everything and he can make the birds come to you. He dwelt among them in the tabernacle and in the temple he gave them special laws and rules that would show all the nations around them how great God was and would set them apart from all the other people. And when they didn't follow those rules, he gave them a way to make it right. He had them do kill sacrifices so that they could be in right relationship with God. Because that's the amazing thing, guys, about God is that the God of the universe wants to be in right relationship with us. And there's so much more I could tell you, but all of these things pointed towards the greatest glorious deed of the Lord ever. And that is that he sent his only son to die on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven and we could live forever in heaven with him again. 
So Pastor Zach is going to talk to mommies and daddies and to grandmas and grandpas and to aunts and uncles and to Sunday school teachers and friends. And he's going to remind us this morning about how important it is that we keep telling you guys about all this stuff so that you can love the Lord too. So let's pray that we all remember to do that and that you guys would love the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would give all of us here at Faith Reformed a passionate love for Jesus so that it would spill over from us and that we would tell and recount the glorious deeds of the Lord to our children so that they would follow them and that they would not forget and that they would not rebel. Lord, I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as mentioned earlier, we recently formed a family and children's discipleship team and mentioned that our purpose is to continue discipling children in the church, even as we have been, but also to come alongside parents and encourage and equip them in the home. And in our initial meetings, we began with this big picture question that is always good to start with when you're thinking about why we do things in the church. And the question is, what is our ultimate vision, goal? Especially for our children. What do we want to see of our children as they grow older into maturity and leave the home? And what we came down to, ultimately, as already mentioned at the beginning, is we want to see them, every single one of them, become committed followers of Jesus Christ. We want them to know Christ through his word and trust him and become more like him. This is the vision that we have for the next generation that ought to drive everything that we do. Because that's ultimately the vision that the Bible has for our children, and that God has for our children. But the next question that we also need to ask is just as important. How do we get there? What do we do in order to see our kids become passionate followers of Christ, especially in our day, as so many in the next generation are going in the opposite direction. It wasn't long ago that John mentioned stats along these lines. The exact number is hard to nail down, but some stats show that somewhere between 50 to 90 percent of the younger generation are growing up in the church and then leaving the church when they grow into maturity and in adulthood. Fewer and fewer have anything close to a Christian worldview. In general, in our culture, children are not growing up to become passionate followers of Jesus Christ. And so it's good for us to have this goal. But we need to know, what do we do to get there? What should we most emphasize? What should we be passionate about? And these are the things that we're going to be thinking about together over the next several weeks. Next week, BJ is going to specifically talk about family discipleship in the home in Deuteron from Deuteronomy 6. But today, we're going to begin with this big picture vision that we find in Psalm 78, which gives us a vision of where everything must begin. And we're going to see, in short, that for our children to become passionate followers of Christ, we must first have a passion to proclaim God's mighty deeds in both our church and in the home. And so let's see that together. We're going to be in Psalm 78. So if you turn to Psalm 78 together, we'll be reading just the first eight verses. It is a 72 verse psalm, but we're just focusing on the first eight. So let us hear God's word together. It's a masculine or a song of Asaph. And here's what we read. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children so that they would, should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, and that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. 
This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we do ask as we come before your word that you would open the eyes of our hearts to behold and see your glorious deeds and this glorious calling to proclaim them to the next generation. Stir a passion in our hearts for this, for we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, it's not hard to see that everything in this passage moves toward this goal in verse 7 of seeing children set their hope in God, knowing his mighty deeds, and keeping his commandments. And this goal in the Old Testament is no different than our goal today. We still want to see our children, the children in our midst, hope in God, especially as he has now revealed himself in the Lord Jesus Christ. We want our kids to know his mighty deeds, to follow in his ways. And what we see in this as well, in this psalm, is that for this to happen in the next generation, it has to begin with us. To see our kids become passionate followers of Jesus Christ, we must first have a passionate commitment to God and his word in the church and the home. And that's what we're going to see today. And so we're first going to see the need for a passionate commitment of the, uh, for the passionate commitment of the church in verses 1 to 4. And then we're going to see the same thing in the family in verses 5 and 6. And then we're going to end by seeing the reasons why we need this passionate commitment in verse 7 and 8. If you have your bulletin on the back, there's an outline that you can follow along in and take notes. And so we're going to see first that to see our kids become passionate followers of Christ, we first need the passionate commitment of the church. We see from the beginning of this psalm that it was written for the whole covenant community. There's this corporate element. He says, Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. He wants all of God's people to hear what he is about to say. And we continue to see this as well in verse 2. As he says, I will open my mouth in a parable and utter dark sayings from of old. Now, if we read the whole 72 verse psalm, we'll see what type of sayings and parables he's talking about. And it has to do, in some ways, with what Emily just talked about in the children's message. About God's gracious care for his people, even in their sin. This psalm outlines the rebelliousness of God's people and yet how God provided for them and was gracious to them. And those stories in the Old Testament serve as a parable for us today. Those are the things that he's talking about. But again, notice that there is this corporate element in this because he says that these are things that we have heard and known and that our fathers have told us. He's telling these things to the whole covenant community so that they would see and know God's mighty deeds as the people of God. And this all leads to this powerful corporate declaration in verse 4. As he says, we will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He's not only writing this psalm for the whole community, he is expressing this unified commitment that together they would be united in declaring to the next generation the glorious deeds of God. They recognized that they were God's people set apart for, by his grace for him. And they wanted even the next generation to know him. And so they had this passionate commitment as a whole community to make known God's deeds to the children in their midst. And as the church in our day, we should still have this same commitment. If anything, we should be even more committed to proclaim God's mighty deeds to the next generation in the church. Because on the one hand, we're not merely united together as a physical nation like Israel. But we are spiritually united in Christ. Not just by physical blood, but by Christ's blood. He died and rose again to adopt us into his family through faith. So that we're brothers and sisters in Christ. We're the body of Christ. We're chosen people. Peter says, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And so we shouldn't just have the mentality that if the kids in this church aren't ours, we shouldn't be concerned about them. We are one in Christ, and we should care about the kids that God has brought into this church family, every single one of them. And on top of that, we have even more glorious deeds to tell them than what Asaph was writing about here. There's this passionate desire of the covenant community in the Old Testament all throughout to declare God's mighty deeds to their children. And we have more mighty deeds today 
to tell our children. As mentioned, this psalm goes on to talk about God's grace and saving them from Egypt and even being gracious to them when they rebelled against him. But we now know how God has been gracious to us, even to the point of death on a cross. In Christ, we have been adopted as his children. We've been forgiven even though we don't deserve it, even though we rebel. We have life beyond the grave through faith in his Son. And we ought to tell these things to our children, that they would embrace Christ themselves. For our kids to become passionate followers of Christ, we need this passionate commitment to tell the next generation about him and all that he has done for us. And it's hard to stress just how important this is, especially in our day. The thing is, most churches in America are concerned about the next generation, and that's good. But the question here isn't simply whether or not we are committed to the next generation. It's whether or not we are passionately committed to making God known to the next generation, to declaring his word to the next generation. And part of the problem in the American church is that we are missing this. David and Sally Michael were founders of Children's Desiring God and have been in children's ministry for decades. And they point out in a recent book that they wrote on children's ministry that this is one of the primary reasons why children are growing up and leaving Christianity. They say it's not because there's a lack of programming or money devoted to children and youth. It's not because we lack a zeal for children. It's largely because, they say, we have lacked a zeal for making God known to children through his word. They go on to say that not even a biblical vision can make up for this lack of zeal, this lack of passion. Because we can say over and over again that we want our kids to become passionate followers of Christ, even as we have laid out in the document that we're putting before you now. It's good to do that. But if we aren't passionate about making God known to them, it won't matter. As it's been said before, truth is more often caught than it is taught. And that's especially the case with children. We know that. They imitate us. They have a passion for what we are passionate about. And so if the church is most passionate about getting kids through the door just to have more numbers, or if the church is more passionate about just having fun with our children in our ministries, then kids are going to think that following Christ is just about having fun. And it doesn't take long for 18-year-olds to leave the home and realize that they can have a lot more fun at places other than the church. That they can have a lot more fun doing things other than following Christ. And so, they're leaving. And they're not following him. But as they go on to mention in their book, if we are passionate as a church about making Christ known through his word, then they will see that following Christ is about so much more than having fun and staying out of trouble. Following Christ is about knowing the God who made us, to know and enjoy him forever, who's broken into this world to forgive us and save us, who provides for us, who cares for us, and who even uses hard things in our lives for our good. He wants us to know him, to be like him. And I have to say, I am really mighty, or I'm really thankful for John at this point in terms of what he's doing with the children and youth in our church. Because he has mentioned multiple times that his goal is not simply programming, but discipleship. He wants God's word to be made known. And I'm also thankful for Wendy and how she has ministered in Adventure Island for the past two decades and has had them memorize scripture week by week. And I'm thankful also for Sunday school curriculum that we have in the church that takes kids through the Bible and for teachers committed to making God's word known. And now what we need in all of these things is to continue on what we find here in this text. That we need to teach these things with a passion for Christ and his word that is caught by the kids. And at the same time, we also need this passionate commitment to filter into everything that we do as the covenant people of God. We should, as a church, pray 
for our children in the church together. We should model Christ's likeness to them. We should rejoice in their being in worship with us, even when they make sounds that we can hear. Because it means that they are hearing God's word proclaimed, not just from the pulpit, but they are seeing us even when we sing, declaring to them the mighty deeds of God. We want them here. We want them to know him. And we should have a joint, unified passion for this together as the covenant people of God. This is a community responsibility to see our children in the church become committed followers of Christ and seeing that that happens as we are passionately committed to making God's mighty deeds known in all that we do. But we also need to see in this text that it doesn't stop there. In fact, we might even say that it doesn't start there. And this leads to our second point. Because to see our kids become passionate followers of Christ, we also need the passionate commitment of the family. We see this really in the whole psalm, but especially in verses 5 and 6. In verse 5, Asaph goes on to say that God established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel. And he's talking about the word of the Lord that was given to Israel, scripture that was written down. Uh, when God made them his own special people, he inspired Moses to write down scripture as a perpetual testimony of God's mighty deeds to his people. And this was also called early on the law. And the law doesn't just mean a bunch of rules. The law actually is a word Torah, which means teaching or instruction and can encapsulate all of what God has taught and given to his people in Scripture, especially the first five books of the Bible. But it's more than just laws. It's God's written teaching, a testimony of who he is and what he has done for his people. And notice how this testimony, this written testimony, Scripture itself, is supposed to be taught. The passage says that he established his testimony and appointed a law which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children. We see this especially in Deuteronomy 6, which BJ is going to fill out next week, that God commanded parents to teach the word to their children in all the stuff of life. And there is probably an emphasis here even on the fathers taking the lead in this. This is something we see all throughout Scripture. We talked about this several weeks ago, the importance of fathers taking the initiative in the home in teaching their kids about God. But the meaning in this text probably does include both. Fathers here mean something like our forefathers or ancestors. Fathers are called to take the lead in teaching God's word, but this includes both parents. And notice the goal in this even looks beyond just the parental teaching of God's word. Because he says that God gave a testimony that he commanded our fathers or forefathers to teach their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and also arise and tell them to their children as well. Uh, in this passage, there's at least three generations here, maybe even four, depending on how you read it. And the goal is to see parents telling God's word to the next generation, to their kids, so that they would know God's word and tell their kids as well. Which means, by the way, that this passionate commitment to proclaim God's word to the next generation is not just a parental thing. But even grandparents should want to see this too. A desire to see generational faithfulness by declaring God's word to our kids and grandkids, to the thousandth generation, so they would know him and live for him. This is a passionate commitment in our families to see God made known through his word, and generation after generation. And one of the things that we really need to see here is the importance of this. That teaching God's word to kids is not just for pastors and for youth directors and Sunday school teachers and core group leaders. Although as mentioned in the first point, we want all those and love and appreciate them. But it's also for parents to teach their kids. In fact, it's primarily for parents to teach their kids. Notice that God even gave the, his word for this purpose. He established a testimony, his word, and then commanded us to teach it to our, our children. God didn't have to have his mighty deeds written down, but he did. And a huge part of the reason is for parents to take that written testimony 
and tell God's mighty deeds to their children. And I think we do recognize the difficulty in this. I think we all as parents recognize the difficulty in this. We get really busy and feel like we don't have time. At other times we feel incompetent and don't know what to do. We're not teachers. And on the one hand, it helps to remember that God doesn't ask us to be perfect. The call of this text doesn't say, give a sermon to your kids every night. Even I don't do that. I think my kids would hate me if I did that. But the call is to tell them God's mighty deeds. And then we do have great resources for this today. In fact, next week we're going to have a couple of storybook Bibles available for all, for all the families in the church. And these can be a great way of helping kids just begin to get a handle on God's mighty deeds. And sometimes what we need is just a little bit of planning. Whether it's after dinner, getting together, or before the kids go to bed, just opening it up and reading a chapter so that our kids would know God's mighty deeds. You do that three to four times a week as they get older, even begin to read a chapter in the Bible together and bring them to church on a weekly basis, and the cumulative effect is huge. And so sometimes we just need a little bit of practical planning and know what God is calling us to. But at the same time, if we're honest, I think that the reason we have a greater difficulty doing this is for something more than just the practical barriers. At the end of the day, and I think we need to be honest about this, we often struggle to tell God's word to our kids because we lack the passionate commitment that we see in this text here. The thing is, and we all know this, we talk about, willingly talk about, what we care about. You can't help it. The grandparents talk about their grandkids. If you're a Packer fan, you talk about the Packers. You can't help it. If you love music, you talk about music. And I think as parents, this is where our priorities do get exposed. It's easy to say that we aren't teachers or don't feel comfortable talking to our kids about spiritual things. But we often are quite comfortable talking to our kids about a lot of other things. We're even comfortable teaching them about a lot of other things. Sometimes we're so comfortable teaching our kids that we're not afraid when they're on the football field to yell out pointers to them. Because we're passionate about those things. We care about how well our kids or grandkids can throw a football or how well they do in school or how well they perform on the piano or whatever it might be. And that's fine. That's good. But a lot of times we need to realize that the reason that we don't tell them the mighty deeds of God is that we're not passionate about that as much as we are about those other things. We need to be honest about that. And I wish at this point that I was able to say this not simply as your pastor, but just as a fellow parent. Because I think a lot of people expect me to be caring about teaching kids, my kids, the Bible because I'm a pastor. But actually, if you look at the stats on pastors and their family, this is a huge problem for pastors in their own homes too. Many pastors are passionate about doing what I'm doing Sunday by Sunday, but struggle to do it in their home because this is hard for everyone. Serving in the church often feels rewarding, like we're part of something bigger. But when you're trying to teach your kids in the home, it can feel like you're beating your head against the wall. And we know this. And this is why what we need is something more than just practical planning. It's why we need a passionate commitment that begins in our hearts to make God known to our children. It begins at the heart level. And so what we oftentimes need is to ask God to stir our hearts, to give us his passion, and to give us perseverance, to make him known. And then take up a children's Bible. Read a chapter in the Bible. Read to your kids. Pray with them. When you're watching your grandkids, do the same thing. You'll have a far greater impact upon your kids and grandkids that I actually can ever have from the pulpit week by week. You will have a greater impact on them as parents and grandparents than any Sunday school teacher can have. That's God's design. And so let us not hide God's glorious deeds from the next generation. But tell them. 
But we also need to see one more thing in our text to understand the gravity of this. We've seen the passionate commitment we need in our church and in our homes to tell God's deeds to the next generation. But now we need to see last the reasons that we need this passionate commitment. We see verse in verse, first in verse 7 that we need the passion, this passionate commitment because there is a goal to reach. As we've already said, we don't just want to tell them about God from the Word to give them information. But there's a goal so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works, works of God, but keep his commandments. Uh, this is the goal. This is our vision. We want them to set their hope in God, to know him as their maker, to embrace Christ as their Lord and Savior, to become, as we've said, passionate followers of Jesus Christ. This is the ultimate goal of declaring God's mighty deeds through the word. Not so that they just know more stuff, but that they would know God. When we think of every child that we serve in the church, or that God has given to us in our homes, this should be our desire, our highest desire, that they would know Him. God has put them in our homes and this church for this reason. That they would set their hope in the living God who has broken into the world in Christ and follow Him as their Savior and Lord. And so we need a passionate commitment to tell them about who God is and what he has done so that they would not forget God's mighty works, but they would remember and embrace him. But notice in verse 8 another reason that we need to have this passionate commitment. There's not only a goal to reach, but a rebellion to avoid. We should be committed to telling them God's word so that they would set their hope in God and that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. And obviously he's writing here about what happened with the Israelites in the wilderness and the ways in which they rebelled against God. It's amazing in reading through the Old Testament to see how often this happened right after God was gracious to them. They forgot him. They didn't remember what he had just done for them. He saved them out of Egypt, out of slavery. He provided for them in the wilderness. And then the second Moses is out of there, they began making a golden calf. They began whining and complaining that he wasn't giving them all that they wanted. They forgot his mighty deeds. Not necessarily remembering them in their head, but embracing them in their heart. And this we need to see is not just a problem for Israel in the Old Testament. The problem that we find that's taught throughout the Old Testament, throughout Scripture, is that this problem is a sin issue that we all have in our hearts. We have a natural sin tendency to forget God, to live as though He isn't real, to go our own way. And every child in our church, and in our homes has this same problem. And so we need to tell them constantly about God. We need to remind them who he is so that they wouldn't forget, but remember. The thing is, if we don't tell our kids constantly about our God, our maker, and who he is, what he has done for us, no one else is going to do this. In fact, in our world today, they're oftentimes getting the exact opposite when God's word isn't passionately being proclaimed, and other things are, the result is ultimately that they forget. And they end up even putting other things above God. This happens so quickly. And the sad fact in the history of the church is that this has happened time and again in churches, denominations, institutions. There's a book called The Dying of the Light that traces some of the major universities in our country along these lines. Harvard and Yale and Princeton and Dartmouth, the University of Chicago even, and more. It's crazy to think about. They all began with a passionate commitment to disciple those kids who were coming up to 18 to 22 year olds. They wanted to educate them with the submission to scripture and making God known. That was their goal. To send them out into the world, not just as good citizens, but as Christians. But in time, every single one of them slowly began being more passionate about secular education than telling them about God. 
And the lack of passion for God eventually became a lack of faith. And now when you go on these campuses, you even find hatred for the faith. And there are so many denominations and churches that have the exact same history. I love reading history and seeing what God has done throughout the world. Reading what God did in Scotland through Presbyterian Christians. It's incredible. It's moving. But if you go to Scotland now, there are several church, historic church buildings that are now use, being used as mosques. Because at some point down the line, there was a failure to be passionate about proclaiming God to the next generation. When Christ is not passionately proclaimed, something else will take its place. And so we need to have a passionate commitment to tell our kids about Christ so they would set their hope in God and not forget his works and rebel, but know him and follow him so that our families in this church would be faithful for generation after generation. And I know if we just take a step back for a minute, as I already mentioned, that we often do feel inadequate for this. I recognize that. This is a heavy call, especially in the home. But I want to end by saying that if we feel weak and inadequate, that's okay. In fact, that's actually preferable. Because when we feel weak, that's when we go to Christ for strength. That's when we ask him for help and for grace to do what he's called us to do because we can't do this in our own power. Our kids can't come to know Christ in our power. It takes a work of God in our hearts and in their hearts. And so if we feel weak, that's okay. We can go to Christ and find grace. And at the same time, this is also why we want to be more intentional in what we are doing as a church along these lines. Part of our aim, as mentioned, is to continue to grow in this passionate commitment in our children's ministry. But we also really want to come alongside families and parents to help strengthen and encourage and equip all of us so that together we would have this commitment. And this is one of the reasons that BJ is coming on as a pastoral assistant in January. He's going to be doing a lot of things for us. But one of the things is he's going to be focusing on coming alongside families and seeing how he can strengthen and encourage parents. But to be clear at the same time, the goal in all of this isn't just to have somebody come on staff or to have a new ministry team. But the goal is to foster a culture in the church in which we partner together as parents, as grandparents, as members of the body of Christ in general, wanting to see God made known to the next generation. This is why we're about to invite parents to go down and hear from Sunday school teachers at the beginning of Sunday school. We want parents to know what's being taught to their kids, to have a passion together for these things. That's why also Anna and Colette are meeting with moms during the Sunday school hour. We need encouragement. We need help. That's why God's brought us together as a church, partly, so that we would encourage and strengthen and edify each other in what he has called us to. Our goal is to foster a unity between church and home so that we together are passionately committed to making Christ known to the next generation. And Lord willing, as we do continue to support each other, to pray for each other, to encourage each other, and look to Christ for forgiveness when we fail, and we do, and strength to continue on, that we will grow in this passionate commitment to make Christ known to our children and our children's children to the thousandth generation for the glory of God and the good of his people. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we do recognize our need for your help. We need a commitment, a passionate commitment for making Christ known to everybody around us and especially to the kids in our home and church. So we ask by your spirit that you would strengthen us that you would help us, equip us, help us to encourage each other, and help us together to ever be a church and to ever be families that have a passion for making Christ known so that in 30, 40, 50, 60 years, we would continue to see this church faithful to your name with more and more children growing up knowing you and living for your glory. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen.
over our offerings and singing to God, be thou my vision. So we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. You are an abundant God, and in all of your great mercy, you have given us so much. Please now take this and use it for your kingdom and glory. In thy name we pray. Amen. in all we do for God to be our vision. And we're now going to affirm our faith together from Westminster Larger Catechism, question 3 and 5, and then John is going to come up, and we're going to begin the process of presenting Bibles to the next generation. So let us hear or respond together and affirm our faith. Question 3 asks this, what is the Word of God? Let us affirm together. The Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testament are the Word of God, and the only rule of faith and obedience. And then question five asks, what do the scriptures principally teach? The scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. Amen. You may be seated. And in light of that, we are now going to see the testimony of God's mighty deeds handed down to the next generation. First thing I'd like to do from Promotion Sunday is call up six... Uh, youth, Josiah Arnson, Seth Arnson, Kale Minen, Reed Minen, Amelia Velsky, and Rebecca Tarter. So if you, if you guys could make your way forward at this time, that'd be great. I was promised them at the beginning of summer, if they read through the missionary biographies, that they would get a king-size candy bar at Promotion Sunday. So these six students did that. <laughs> you guys can line up a little bit. Something. I know you guys are, are ready for this, but... Uh, yeah, offers there for everyone. I fully plan on doing it again next year. All you got to do is read a biography, you get a candy bar, and you get to learn about a missionary. So Amelia gets an M&M. Uh, the Arnsons get Kit Kats. I think Kale gets a Kit Kat. Reed gets Reese's. And Rebecca gets a Milky Way and a Caramello. Guys, you may be seated. And on that note, we will invite up the sixth graders and one parent per sixth grader to hand out the Bibles. And uh, yeah, you guys can start making your for it at this time. And last year, the education committee decided that we would give Bibles to second graders and sixth graders. So the second graders get their first Bible, and then sixth graders get a student study Bible. And then as Pastor Zach mentioned, we're also going to give out picture Bibles and storybook Bibles to any family in the congregation that would like one. He will explain more about those next week, and we'll have them available on the back table. 
But because we have already given out to second graders their Bibles from past years, we just have sixth graders this year. So Pastor Zach, I think, I don't think you need those two. But you can give them to the parents for now. We have, we have Carissa Konzak, Braylon Minen, Caleb Eberspacher, Natalie Brookink, Nolan Minen, Grace Minert, and Aubrey Fleischman. I think the only two that are missing are Nolan Norris and uh, Grace Hunink. So they will get theirs later. But yeah, as a church, as Pastor Zach talked about, our job is to join together to raise up the youth in love and knowledge of God and all of his ways. But the greatest influence is always going to be the parents. And God commands parents to make God's word central in their children's lives. So in addition to Psalm 78, I always like to read through Deuteronomy 6, which says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be on the frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates." So the idea here is that God's word should be everywhere. We should be teaching them to the youth and to your children all the time. We should be living them out so that they can be caught as well as taught. And just they should be everywhere so that God's word and his ways would be central in their lives. So on that note, parents, symbolically, you can hand your Bibles down to your children at this time. And you can give them a round of applause. You guys may be seated. And on, a, on that note, I'd like to encourage everyone to take advantage of our education programs this year, from the adult Sunday school classes and the small groups that we have for adults to the youth programs. We have Sunday school, where we help the youth learn the big picture of what's in the Bible. That includes the catechism for the high schoolers. On Wednesday night, we have a topical ministry for K through 12, where we tackle topics and see what the scripture has to say about them. And then for grades 6 through 12 on Sunday night, we have core where we go to the scripture and let that decide what we're going to be talking about and as we learn how to read through the Bible together. So all these ministries have different purposes and they are all valuable. Uh, one other note that I should mention that I haven't mentioned yet is the Sunday school offering. That goes to Compassion International. We take that every week in our uh, three-year-old through 12th grade Sunday school classes. We currently sponsor two students, Daniela from Ghana and Kartik from Bangladesh. So there's info below the bulletin board in the back if you'd like to see anything about those two students. I always encourage the high schoolers to give $1 per week, but uh, that, that part of that is just to get in the habit of giving at church, but students are encouraged to give whatever they would like to Compassion International. So normally this is the time when I would tell the students who their teachers are and we would send them down together, but we're going to do it differently this year, as Pastor Zach mentioned. The parents of kids grades 8 on down will bring their students to the basement. They'll be able to find their teachers. They'll have signs on the doors to find those things. And the parents will have a chance to meet the teachers and also to learn about what the youth will be going through this year. So teachers, when we start the doxology, we can head out and get down to our classrooms and beat the parents down. And as soon as the service is done, then the parents and kids can make your way down as well. So I just covered the, the prayers of the congregation this year as we start a new year of discipleship from adults all the way down to youth. Just be in prayer that God will be at work in all of our hearts, that we come to know him more and live out his ways in everything that we do. And then a couple other things, and we're going to pray and close out our service. Adult Sunday School is going to be back in the sanctuary immediately afterwards. And so it's going to be quick, and so you can, if you're staying for Adult Sunday School, just stay in your seat. Um, and for those elders who would be in the back, and for myself, we're not going to go ahead and stay out there and greet you all, um, because everybody's going to be filtering out and going down and so forth. And so if you're not going down to the basement, you can stay for Sunday School. If you want to go out to the great room, you can do that too. We do encourage you to stay in Sunday School. But, uh, but we are going to go ahead and not have greeters uh, for that purpose. And so with that said, let us now go to God together in prayer. Gracious Father, we do thank you for the immense privilege of being part of your work in this world. On the one hand, you call us to make disciples of the nations, and we partner with those proclaiming your word around the world. And you also call us, Lord God, to make disciples of all generations, to make your name known to our children 
their children's children. Father, in anything that we do, we recognize that apart from your spirit, we can do nothing. And so we ask that we would not just plan, but we ask that you would empower. That you would be at work in Sunday school this morning, that you would be at work in CORE tonight, that you'd be at work in Connect and Adventure Island on Wednesday nights, that you'd be at work in the home as we seek to talk to our kids about truth on a consistent basis as we lay down and rise up and in all that we do. Father, may we be a people that consistently make Christ known, especially to the next generation. Father, we do ask that you'd be at work around the world. We recognize that you're the God that raises up leaders and brings them down, that there are kingdoms that rise and fall, but your kingdom endures forever. And we think, of course, about the death of Queen Elizabeth and the change in a new generation, that, uh, what's happening in the Western world. We recognize that you are sovereign and in control of all these things. And we ask that in the midst of this, that you would be at work in those that are bringing the gospel to the UK, especially as it has been so lost in recent generations. We pray this morning for Tom and Tanya Clyde and their recent move from the Czech Republic to the UK. And we ask that you would use them to consistently be active in planting churches there so that Christ would be made known. Lord, we pray that you would also be at work in all that we do in and around our community, that we would, in the midst of our partnership with other churches in town, in our unified desire to see Christ made known uh, with all the churches in this town and beyond, that we would have this unified commitment in making Christ known, especially to the next generation. And Father, we do thank you for John and what he does week after week and day after day to do just that, and for Wendy, and for all those who are at work to do this work, and for the Sunday school teachers today, empower them, equip them, help them by your spirit to be active and engaged in making disciples. Father, we also ask that you would continue to be with those struggling with different things in the life of our congregation. Be with Gail Meerdink again. Bring her to full health. And may she be able to worship with us soon. We pray for Don Scruce and that you would allow him to also uh, have his heart issues resolved. And that you'd give him comfort and peace in the process. Lord, we also pray for those who suffered in the semi-crash this last week. Father, we ask that you'd be with those and their families. And that you would use this for the good of your people and that you would strengthen and encourage those suffering and grieving. And Father, now as we go on to uh, continue on in Sunday school and to live our lives out for your glory, may we consistently do so in deep dependent upon your grace, knowing that we can do nothing apart from Christ, and with our eyes upon him, may we have a passionate commitment to make Christ known to all those around us, especially in our church and in our homes. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen. And now let's stand together and receive the Lord's blessing as we go. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, that your whole spirit and soul and body would be kept blameless at his coming. He who called you is faithful, and he will surely do it. Amen.